let me bring to the show Carl Knuckles, CEO of Crystal Energy. Good morning, Carl. Thank you so much for joining us. Good morning, Alex, and thank you for having me with you. Uh, so, Carl, I'd like to kick off with, with the OPEC meeting. Do you think that they're going to resist on external pressures uh, to pump up uh, more oil, of course? Well, look, I mean, everything is possible, but when you look at market fundamentals, I don't see major changes that would drive the organization to drift away from its decision that was taken in July, which is to put 400,000 barrels a day between then, between August and, and the end of the year. Now, yes, there are uh, increasing pressures from, not only by the way, from the US through Joe Biden, but also from other important consumers such as Japan and India. However, if I zoom in on the political pressure coming from the US, uh, here I'm a, I'm a bit hesitant to really describe it as pressure because it's not really a pressure to push the organization to put additional barrels in the market. But for me, I see it more as the American administration, the Biden administration, trying to find somebody to blame um, the high prices that, that the consumer, American consumer is facing at the petrol station on somebody. And who is better than um, uh, OPEC to blame that on? And you can see already in the language that they are using, for a while we did not hear the word cartel to describe OPEC, but now the Secretary of Energy described OPEC as a cartel. Um, so we can see there is more of a political game than really strong market fundamentals that would push OPEC to listen to the pressure uh, um, coming from the US. And also there is another sh additional point that we don't hear people talking about, we don't hear President Biden talking about, the fact that actually the US is not anymore or solely in the largest oil consuming nation in the world. It is also the largest oil producing nation in the world. And therefore, yes, high prices may be detrimental to the consumer side, but they can be extremely beneficial for local producers, which translate into more hiring, more taxes paid to the government. So it's not really clear cut uh, the position of the US today. Yeah, it's not, that's for sure, because from one side they're pushing into um, for more green economy in the US, on the other side they're asking for more, uh, of course, output production uh, from the OPEC countries, specifically Saudi Arabia. Um, I was wondering at this point if OPEC was about to continue with its slow oil output, uh, as it is the most likely scenario for now, where are prices heading to? If everything else remains the same, let's say demand continues to grow at the rate that we saw over the last few months and no additional supplies come to the market, then we might see further up upward pressure on prices. And we see already some financial institutions, they are uh, you know, uh, betting on almost $90 uh, a barrel for Brent by the end of the year. But we can also see some cracks emerging, including the spread of coronavirus in China. And China has used, you know, it has adopted a zero tolerance policy. I don't know whether they can stick to that. And what does that mean to their economy? There are additional supplies creeping in from the US and not just in terms of shale production, but remember that we had some barrels that remained off the market because of Hurricane Ida. That is being restored gradually into the market. Now, there is the other factor, which I don't think is going to impact current, immediately the market, but it will impact market sentiment. The return of Iran to the negotiation uh, table regarding its nuclear uh, plans. So that could mean perhaps, you know, more exciting um, dynamics for next year. But at the moment you have, of course, the trend, if it continues, it will be through to higher prices. But there are other forces at play which may limit the increase that we might see between now and the end of the year. So do we have a number, all price number, that could be too much? Now that is something that really nobody knows. You can guess it, but you don't know, you know when uh, it, will ha it will happen and what impact will it have. But if we look at, um, you know, traditionally in terms of, you know, previous experience, Usually, when you see the, 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 the well, when you talk about you know the impact of that price, it's mainly on demand destruction. By the time that becomes notable and visible, it becomes too late. So therefore, you end up having this kind of decline and collapse in prices, and then it takes them back a lot of time to recover. So nobody really knows what is the uh, inflection point that will happen. 
especially that you do have globally uneven economic growth, even for oil markets is still uneven. Otherwise, OPEC would have adopted perhaps different strategy than what they had agreed on over the last few months. So the honest answer, nobody knows. I don't want to guess that other people guess uh, on air, but I, I think that usually by the time we realize that oil prices are really negatively impacting oil demand, that is usually too late to recuperate. So I just wanted to very quickly um, hear a take when it comes to the COP26. We saw major commitments, major pledges, that's for sure. The World Methane Pact, the, the Deforestation Pact. Then we also saw today that 28 countries have joined an international alliance dedicated to uh, phasing out coal. But the world's biggest polluters are not among them. And we're talking about, of course, the China, India and the United States, which is pretty important point to make, that's for sure. I was wondering, do you think that a concrete steps have been taken um, towards uh, the uh, towards greener economy cop 26 if you want to judge it first of all it's a little bit uh, premature to judge it at this stage but i see it more like beauty they say it's in the eyes of the beholders so <laughs> from the climate activists they don't think that uh, must much has been achieved in terms of where they want to, they would like to see things going and other people see it like, no, hold on. There has been already um, uh, some progress compared to previous meetings. Um, and there are some pledges. And some of those interesting pledges is, as you said, uh, limiting or even phasing out coal in power generation, I think, in almost 40 countries. And that is a very important factor because coal is the largest emitter of CO2 compared to the other fossil fuel that is oil and natural gas. And actually, that could be good news for oil and especially for gas, actually, because coal and gas compete um, perfectly in a power generation. There is an issue of deforestation they want to limit. There is, you know, progress on climate financing. So there has been in progress but as you said there are also limitations because the big polluters did not for example take part in this coal pledge including china uh, the us australia but if i move away a little bit from these micro details there is one important issue governance who is going to be out there by 2050 or 2060 or 2070 when we hear about countries around the world pledging to become net zero Who's going to be there to ensure that these are uh, um, uh, these have been met or implemented properly? Who will be held accountable, and how, whether you will going to include a, an enforcement mechanism? When you look at this picture from the governance side of the energy transition of climate change, there are lots of missing parts to declare victory in terms of all these pledges made here and there. The taxonomy, I mean, only when I think about green finance, yes, there has been progress in terms of green bonds and climate financing at COP26, but finally, one universal definition and internationally accepted definition for what is green finance you don't have a universally accepted definition yet so, so do you think that it would be very useful to have some kind of surveillance body i wouldn't call it surveillance i would say governance body um, that is definitely something that these countries should agree on because and it may not be one big giant institution it may be you know several institutions looking after different aspects let me think about for example something that has not been extensively discussed like carbon pricing mechanism if you want to impose um, carbon on uh, imports or to avoid carbon leakage between one country and the other then you need to bring in on board you know an organization that is more involved in trade and it could be an existing organization so, such as the world trade organization so it doesn't have to be like creating a massively bureaucratic body, but you need to have a system in place that ensures that these targets are being met. You also need to be able to quantify progress. So, you know, you can just throw any kind of target, but if you are unable to measure progress, I don't think you're going to get too far. Very final take. Do you think that um, all these steps towards greener uh, finance, greener world and, and everything, whatever we want to call it, uh, will have a negative impact on crude oil prices and energy uh, prices in the very long term? Of course, we're not talking about a short term. In the very long term, definitely, because you're talking about a shrinking market for oil, whereby you have demand getting smaller and smaller, and you'll have stronger competition between existing players. And I mean, just think about how many countries are sitting on large 
um, oil reserves, proven oil reserves, that they would like to see producing. So if we're talking about the very long term, there is no doubt that the energy transition is going to put downward pressure on prices, and that's going to lead to stronger competition between producers. And here, if I may conclude by saying that the Middle East oil producers in particular have a clear advantage, but that advantage can be fully exploited if they are clever enough to pursue aggressively economic diversification so their economies don't suffer if prices are low. Thank you very much, Carol Knuckles, CEO of Crystal Energy. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great day ahead. Thank you, you too.